My dear friends, on behalf of the World Jewish Congress, I am so pleased to welcome you to the final event of our four-part series on the history and culture of the Jewish community. Of Jewish community of France, I should say. We are co-sponsoring this program with the Council General of France in New York and the Museum of Jewish Art and History of Paris. And for today's web talk, the 92nd Street Y. We are privileged to hear two contemporary Jewish leaders from France and New York as they discuss the current challenges facing the Jewish community in France today. We began this project as a strong statement of support of the French Jewish community, which we are so proud to have as our affiliate. I want to especially thank Council General Anne Claire Legand, uh, who I think has gone above and beyond her role to make this project a great success and for her wonderful friendship to the World Jewish Congress and our entire Jewish community. Council General, you'll be greatly missed in New York as you advance your highly successful diplomatic career. It is now my honor to turn the microphone over to Ambassador Philippe Etienne, Ambassador of France to the United States, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Dear Ambassador uh, Lauder, distinguished rab rabbis, dear friends, I am delighted to open this uh, discussion between Rabbi Peter Rubinstein and Rabbi Benjamin Orvilleur. And uh, as you said, Ambassador, this event is part of a series organized uh, together with the Consulate General in New York. And I want also to pay tribute to Anne Claire and to the amazing uh, work and the amazing job she has done in, has been doing in New York. Let me say that it is also an honor to be hosted by um, 92Y, this um, organization which welcomed uh, President Macron after he was elected when he came to uh, hold his first seat in September 2017 in New York City. I was with him. Let me thank Tom Kaplan for his friendship, his warm welcome. Uh, I thank you also, Rabbi Rubinstein. We are all looking forward to listening to, to the to, to this discussion. I, I just want to say a word uh, about uh, how the fight uh, against uh, anti-Semitism is a, a critical issue for France, as it is for our democracies at large. France, uh, as you know, is, is home to a very large uh, Jewish community after the, the Israel and the US. And uh, unfortunately, the plague of uh, anti-Semitism is, is spreading again. Uh, there is no simple way to fight it. Uh, but that fight must be relentless. As the philosopher Jacques Marita put it in April 1939, in order to fight anti-Semitism, I quote, everything must be done, every possible remedy tried, however insufficient, each may seem by itself. Our message is indeed clear and simple, which is how President Emmanuel Macron put it at the Trif dinner last year. I quote again, we must never falter, we will never fail to denounce anti-Semitism or to fight against this scourge. Anti-Semitism is a shame of France, and we fight every day for a republic of honor and fraternity. France would not be France if its Jewish citizens, our people, had to leave because they were afraid. In this spirit, Emmanuel Macron went to Israel in January to commemorate at the World Holocaust Remembrance Center of Yad Vashem, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. In his vibrant speech delivered uh, to Israel's French community, um, he renewed his vote to fight anti-Semitism in France, reasserting this obvious and yet fundamental fact. I quote again, anti-Semitism in France is first and foremost a problem for the Republic, and the Republic protects all its children at its heart. Our response must be unwavering. France has taken very serious, serious steps to fight this unacceptable charge. Upon the election of President Macron, the National Plan Against Racism and Anti-Semitism was adopted to fight at all levels of the society. In the short term, to make sure our citizens are safe and that anti-Semitic incidents are duly and swiftly prosecuted. 
France has the toughest criminal laws when it comes to anti-Semitic acts. Our system has been further reinforced by the adoption by the French Parliament of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism to help train our judges, educators, and security enforcement officers in detecting and responding to this form of racism. Beyond the security approach, we are educating our children against anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial so that they can stand up and say never again when their time comes. Each school year, this effort is conducted in close cooperation with the Memorial of the La Sh Le Memorial de la Shoah and Yad Vashem. An award in honor of Ilan Halimi has been created to recognize student projects and that encourage them to remember. But educating and preventing racist and anti-Semitic ideas from spreading has become more difficult with the spread, with the spread of hate online. This is why starting a dialogue with the social network platforms and also in building an international cooperative effort to fight hate speech online is a key priority for France. Freedom of expression is a pillar of our democracy. But we cannot just hide behind this principle when people are actually being killed as a result of hate being spilled online against them. President Macron launched the Christchurch call to action with Prime Minister Arden, and this call has been answered by states and social networks. At the domestic level, France adopted unprecedented legislation this past May called the Avia Bill, which holds both the content producer and the platform that harbor him or her accountable for hateful anti-Semitic or racist messages. We will continue this, this discussion with our European and American partners to strengthen this effort. The fight against anti-Semitism, we need to, needs to be fought together on both sides of the Atlantic because it touches the cornerstone of our democracy, freedom of living and believing in peace and security, because its ramifications are now global and require a global effort to combat it. We know, Ambassador, we can count on the World Jewish Congress uh, to work with all of us. And um, thank you, uh, Ambassador Loder, for your support, your very, very strong leadership and your action. And we look forward to doing so with the many friends who are attending this discussion. Thank you very much for giving me the floor for this introduction. And now uh, I look forward to, uh, I like all of you to listening to Rabbi Rubinstein and Rabbi Orvila. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador. And on behalf of both uh, Rabbi Orvila and myself, uh, we thank both you and Ambassador Lauder for these wonderful introductions. Um, I would tell our listening and viewing audience that uh, these two rabbis have known each other long enough that we're going to use our first names in a, an act of informality. Uh, so Delphine, it's great to be with you again. Um, as I know, your, your book, which is going to be published eventually in the United States, Anti-Semites and Jews in the 21st Century, uh, is a bestseller in France. Um, I have two questions about that. Uh, why do you think it has become a bestseller and how do you come to write it? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for this invitation. I want to say it's a real pleasure to spend this moment with you. I was uh, supposed to be physically in New York, actually. and But even though I can't be with you physically, the, joining you on through this screen is a uh, well, a very important moment for me, important because, as you said, we've known each other for many years and you were my mentor when I was in rabbinical school and also joining you through the 92nd Street Y is very meaningful for me because, as I told you, uh, uh, 18 years ago, uh, precisely, uh, I joined a lecture. I was then a tourist in New York and I came to the 92nd Street Y to join a lecture. And on that day, I decided to join rabbinical school. So um, being back uh, in the walls of the 92nd Street is actually very meaningful uh, for me. So um, as uh, I don't know if you can hear me now, it seems to me that the screen is uh, somehow frozen. So I hope uh, you hear me. 
I can hear you. Um, can hear I don't know what's you. happened to my okay. cam, uh, but uh, no. you please okay. keep going. If you can hear me, that's already something. Yeah. Um, so the book was released in France uh, at the beginning of year 19, so to 2019. And on the, um, the week it was released, uh, the French government released uh, new statistics. They Precisely on the same week, they announced that there was a rise in 74% in the number of anti-Semitic incidents in France both serious and less serious verbal and physical uh, aggressions. Uh, and so um, it was quite weird, actually, that the book precisely was released the same, uh, uh, the same week where everybody in the news wanted to understand uh, how this could happen. We were exactly 74 years after the end of the war, and the government was announcing the same terrible number, like 74% in rising anti-Semitism. And um, so um, I think many people and already for years have been trying to understand um, this rise all around the world, actually, again, in anti-Semitism. I feel that I belong to a generation that was convinced that uh, we would not have to experience that. You know, it seems to me that I grew up um, having the feeling that I belong to a generation that was born too short, short after the the Shoah, and uh, and we were somehow convinced that we would be immunized or prevented for experiencing or fighting this war. And uh, it seems to me that something changed for us, for our generation, maybe already in the 1990s, but probably at the beginning of year 2000, that we realized slowly that anti-Semitism was on the rise. No one yet wanted to talk about it. Uh, the French Jewish community started to talk about it. And at the beginning, people said, um, well, maybe it's an exaggeration. Maybe, you know, uh, it's not really a rise in anti-Semitism. And it took many years for the people to be aware of this uh, uh, phenomenon. And I decided that um, I had to search into our tradition, actually. That's what my book is trying to do. There were many books written about anti-Semitism from a political point of view, a sociological point of view, and sometimes even a psychoanalytical point of view. But I decided to dive into Jewish sources and rabbinic literature to figure out what, what our sages and what our tradition has to say about um, hate of Jews along history. It's not that we have the answer or that the rabbis know exactly uh, what is the cause of anti-Semitism, but they're somehow aware that there are specific conditions in a society or in a group or in a family that enable um, anti-Semitism to be on the rise. And it seems that it's very relevant for today because what the rabbis seem to be aware of pretty early in history is quite at stake today in our society. You know, for example, they tell us that each time there is an obsession uh, on the notion of identity, an obsession on notions of purity, authenticity, so you can be pretty sure that um, Jews will be accused of preventing you from achieving purity and authenticity. And pretty soon they will be the scapegoats of the story as we know. And we seem to stand exactly there today. So I think that's a, an explanation of why the book became a bestseller in France here. It was quite weird for me to see that in the subway, in the metro here and in the buses and in the street, people were reading a rabbinic book, you know, with a lot of midrash and rabbinic literature. But this, uh, this is what happened. And the book now is translated to many, many languages and hopefully soon to English. Well, it's a fascinating uh, answer, and uh, of course, leads us to so many different questions. But the, I have—I want to ask one question about you, and I know I'm not on the screen, but it's much better for the audience to just see you if they had to choose between us. Uh, <laughs> you've really emerged as a, a, a tremendous leader, in, both in Paris and France, religious leader, certainly. Uh, and those of us who know you can understand why that's happened. But do you think it says something about changes in France? Well, I, I don't know. It's, it's a it's a good question. It, it seems to me that uh, in the past uh, years, 
for sure, France has been going through a, a lot of um, internal questioning around um, the role and the place of religion in society. You know, uh, for maybe um, the American audience, it's not well known, but um, the French recipe, let's say, of the French Republic, what we could call the Republican promise of France, could be could be summarized in the following way. Um, the French nation and the French Republic promises each individual that he or she will always be able to speak in the first person singular, but will never be able to speak in the first person plural as a community or as belonging to a community because the only first person singular in the nation is the nation itself. So France guarantees you as a citizen that you'll be able to express your individuality, your ability to speak in the first person singular and somehow protect you from any type of pressure that might um, pose on you your belonging to an ethnicity or a religion. But in recent years, this French traditional and historical recipe has been challenged by the rise in France of what we call communautarism. I have no idea if I can translate it in English to communautarism. It wouldn't mean anything, I think, in English. It's the idea that in France, slowly in recent years, more and more people have developed a tendency when they speak, even in the first person singular, they speak about their community. They speak as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a member of the LGBT community as a woman, you know, and it's something that totally counters what has been along centuries, the promise of French laicity, secularism. And I feel that um, this requested from maybe um, the French nation to change its approach to religious voices. And it's true that I feel in recent years that um, people like me, I'm, I'm not the only one, like other religious leaders in France, um, have been invited to take part differently in the national um, in the national debate. You know, I could point to one moment that has been um, probably a life changing experience for me and. Actually, I think it summarizes your question. Um, in January 2015, the um, Charlie Hebdo journal was uh, attacked in this terror attack where uh, many people died at the news Charlie Hebdo newspaper, the magazine. And um, one of the women killed there, actually the only woman that was killed on that day, Charlie Hebdo, her name was Elsa Kayat and her family asked me to lead the funeral. And I found myself, and I will never forget this moment that was not only for me, but for the nation, um, a, a, like a change in history. I think I, I was standing at the, at the cemetery in Paris uh, and, and the Jewish community, it was immediately after also the hyper kasher attack. And I was leading this ceremony and the, um, Charlie Hebdo team was there and the Jewish community was there and it felt that in a very interesting manner we were connecting on that day and trying to shape what would be new alliances in the new world and the unknown world that was just opening in front of us. I remember it was quite a actually a funny moment if, if someone can laugh, laugh on that day, that the family of Elsa Kayat asked me to come close. Elsa Kayat was culturally very Jewish, but they, her family is quite anti-religious in her, in her way. You know, she was working at Charlie Hebdo and in a way she developed a kind of very anti-religious <laughs> rhetoric. And, uh, and they brought me close to the family and, and the sister of Elsa Kayat said to the other um, guests, or the other people who were attending the funeral, she said, she's the rabbi, but don't worry, she's a secular rabbi. And I was like totally in shock with her. So it, it, you know, and I could understand what she meant that somehow um, there was not only room, but there was a request at this time for other type of religious discourse that people were not used to hear, you know. And I feel that today progressive voices of our religious traditions are um, heard differently 
in France and Europe than they used to be. Well, you actually did write a book with a, um, a, a liberal Islam leader uh, talking about that. Uh, has that cut across other divides in France, the racial divide, for instance, which of course now is a topic of great discussion here in the United States? Yeah, so I wrote a book with Rashid Benzin, who is an Islamologist. He comes from Morocco and we, we are very good friends. Anyway, we decided to write a book because I think both of us um, um, reached the same conclusions in recent years and um, experienced a weird transformation uh, that um, it seems that in recent years we became somehow only Jews or Muslims. I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that. I don't count the number of times that during an interview here in France in recent years, I need to explain that I'm not only Jewish, you know. And one of the effects of this communitarism that was strengthened in France in recent years, uh, I think the situation is totally different in, in America because obviously you have a very different history of uh, relationship to identities and to religious identities. But for, for, France it's, but for France, it's a new phenomenon that in recent years, I constantly had to explain to people that I'm Jewish, but I'm also a woman who experienced living abroad and who has children, but who lived outside of France for a few years. You know, I'm trying to complexify my discourse to enable the discussion not simply to unclose me into one element of my identity, because I feel that we are somehow sick, beyond sick. We are like threatened by this tendency to unlock people into just a very impoverished definition of themselves, you know? So I feel that what I'm trying to do, and I've been trying to do for years now in my conversations with other religious leaders, is to reconnect to like complex definitions of ourselves that are the only thing that can enable us to continue talking to each other. And you know, I think it, it has everything to do with the rise in anti-Semitism. I'm convinced that anti-Semitism always goes end in end with the refusal of dealing with complexity. You know, when a society wants to simplify um, everything uh, in the background, you know, when you want to perceive people as being uh, right or wrong, black or white, you know, if, when you really, when you get rid of complexity of belongings. So I think there is a threat uh, of anti-Semitism in the background. And I think the, um, the social media, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook and other, doesn't help us on that matter. You know, there is a tendency in our society to, yeah, to simplify the debate instead of complexifying it. And I think Jewish tradition can truly help us in that matter. We've always been along history, very good at complexifying. Uh, you know, we always say that when you ask a Jew one question, he will give you at least uh, five different answers. I think our tradition is a tradition that really cherishes uh, complexity uh, and subtlety. And I think we desperately need, need this in our personal definitions today and in our national and collective definitions. Yeah, I, I, so I, is, it, um, is this unique to Jews? In other words, this complexity that we are both us and them, right? That we are we're always straddling at least two worlds, if not many more. Uh, is this something that's born out of our history? And, and if you could just give some examples, because you did, I think, in, in the book, some examples of how that complexity was born into our very being, into the core of who we are. Yes. Yeah, I think we could give thousand examples from the Jewish literature. I could give, for example, now a first one. I, I dive in the book a lot into the book of Esther. The book of Esther is probably the biblical book that speaks the most about anti-Semitism. Of course, the word doesn't appear because it's a very modern concept. But the eight of Jews is really central in the book of Esther through the character of Aman, who represents the eighter of Jews. Um, and what is interesting is that in the very first line of the book, um, we hear uh, what is the reproach that Aman has toward the Jews. And he basically says, you know, there is in the kingdom 
a people who is like us but not like us they have they they follow our rules but also their own rules and this accusation is actually a permanent and very central accusation in anti-semitism and anti-semitic accusation along history we have always accused jews of being both the same and the other we hate the jews when they are different but we actually even hate them more when they're just like us, you know, uh, we can't stand that they stay aside, but actually it's even more bothering when maybe your neighbor is a Jew or your president, and maybe you don't know that your physician is a Jew, you know, the idea that the Jew is both very visible, but invisible, just like you, but different from you, is is, is something that is special in, I would say, in the anti-Semitic discourse. It's different from the racist or the typical racist discourse. You know, racism is about uh, being threatened by otherness, by pure otherness. But anti-Semitism is a threat that people perceived when they're threatened both that someone would like them and not like them. What is interesting is that in Jewish tradition, we there seems to be a very strong awareness that we are who we are because we owe something to otherness. You know, we keep repeating it constantly in the Jewish uh, calendar, in the Jewish sacred narratives, that we uh, were born in Egypt, that we came out of um, Ur, you know, through the story of Abram. And actually, we are who we are because we are aware that, we, that uh, our origin is not pure, that actually, we had to take a journey uh, and to keep in memory um, the um, foreignness that exists in us from the beginning. You know, for example, the Jewish calendar counts the, the, name, the name of the months are Babylonian uh, months. Uh, we, when we celebrate Passover, we use Roman uh, symposium uh, symbols. You know, it's, it seems that Judaism is obsessed with the idea that our identity is an ability to deal with meeting the other and integrating elements of otherness into our identity. So my, I, I, to say it differently, I would say that in Judaism, we keep teaching that you are you, who you are because at the core of who you are, there is something that is not you. So, you know, it, it's, it, it's interesting because another example is that is the, the name of our primary institution, synagogue, you know, is, comes from the Greek, uh, the Greek word. So but one of the other things and I'm, I'm thinking as you talk about what a challenge that is to the, the nationalist, right, to the one who says we need purity of our people, whether the, the folk in, in Germany or you know whatever that. This is a time when we have to draw back beyond, you know, behind the, the get our own national ghetto walls, and um, and let's keep that purity of, of spirit and blood uh, alive. And therefore, Jews don't really have a place in that, do they? Yeah, I think, I think you're really touching the for me the core of the um, hate against the uh, Jews. I mean, each time a society becomes sometimes it's a society, sometimes it's an individual, sometimes it's a tribe or a family or a group. But the moment this group or this person becomes obsessed with purity and authenticity, so this is the slippery slope because actually very very fast the Jew. And it doesn't matter if the Jew is around or sometimes, you know, there is anti-Semitism even when there are no Jews around. But the Jew become the name, becomes the name of what prevents you from reaching this purity. And it has been present in the anti-Semitic rhetorics all along history, you know. Obviously, it, it was present uh, in the Middle Age when Jews were accused of bringing uh, disease and polluting and poisoning the wells. It was present, obviously, in the Nazi Germany when Jews were accused of being a polluting agent. But it was also present more recently, you probably, well, obviously you remember in Pittsburgh, uh, almost two years ago when the, the, um, the, 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 the guy stepped into the synagogue to kill uh, worshippers and um, uh, we, we tried to understand what was his motive and he, he said that he was accusing the Jews to uh, letting caravans of migrants pollute the soil of the United States, you know. So this rhetoric of pollution and contam contamination was always um, 
at stake and the Jews have always been associating with kind of what I would call the porosity of frontiers. You know, they're accused of making the frontiers of your spirit, of your society, of your body more porous and uh, preventing you from being truly, firmly yourself. And I think we should really be aware of this in the period we're experiencing now as we are going through a pandemia because uh, undoubtedly this rhetorics of purity and this fear of contamination, as we know, will probably get an anti-Semitic translation somehow. Yeah, which in fact translates very easily into the uh, the theories that, you know, anti-Jewish and, and Semitic theories that we're the ones who are responsible for the pandemic, right? That it would, we are the both, the car we are the contaminants. Yeah. Yeah, or we are some, either we are the contaminant, or somehow we are managing to gain something of this uh, pandemia. Because obviously, Jews are always accused of being in a situation of manipulation. You know, if you look, and it's pretty interesting, even though I, I'm not sure if you don't want to have nightmares, I'm not sure it's a good idea. But if you look at anti-Semitic caricature along history, of obviously the Jews are represented with the, you know, their nose and their ears, but. On all pictures, you see uh, drawings of very long ends because the Jews are, are always accused of being in a situation of uh, domination and therefore of manipulation of the world. You know, they control right. either themselves or they control the controlling powers of the world, which enables you to, to get rid of any responsibility. I think it's, it's, you know, it's very common. Anti-Semitism is very common, actually, because... Uh, if you want well, to get rid of right. we're going to benefit. We're going to benefit from these tragedies somehow. There's there's a benefit to us. I mean, one of the one yeah. of the I think paradoxes is that, and that you point out is the accusation that Jews uh, have everything which the hater aspires to have, and on the other hand, we're perceived as being less than uh, men. I mean, and I use men not in the in the generic humanity humanity, but less than men because I think. Um, you know, one of your chapters is about uh, this whole issue of, you know, anti-Semitism and sex, right? Gender um, and, mm -hmm. and how we're perceived. Yeah, um, in the book, I, I researched a lot this question of the link between misogyny and anti-Semitism. Actually, all along history, Jews and women have been accused pretty much of the same things. Like, you know, Jews and women are accused to be a... Uh, um, hysterical and, and people think they love money and they love to be close to powerful people uh, and you, they can't, they're not reliable, etc., etc. I know this rhetoric is common to both hates, women and, and Jews. And again, it's not surprising because I think femininity and Jewishness both represent um, openness to otherness, like the idea that it has something to do with uh, another who is both like you but different from you and has something to do with your origin and uh, and who you are but it, it's true the other point that i'm raising in the book that you just mentioned is uh, the fact that in a very interesting and paradoxical manner jews are always accused of being both more and less you know they they've been accused of things of contrary things simultaneously along history. You know, Jews have been accused of being too rich and too poor, of leading society or being parasites of the society. They've been accused of, um, you know, benefiting from the system or owning the system. They've been accused of being a Bolshevik and capitalist, and they've been accused of being patriarchal or too feminist, you know, and you can accuse them of both things simultaneously, of being less and more. And it's actually an interesting difference, again, between racism and anti-Semitism. Mm. Uh, because I think very often racism is based on the idea that the other is below you. The idea that your civilization or your color of skin or your accent or whatever makes you, you know, like someone more civilized or someone who stands above the other. Whereas anti-Semitism is often built on the, um, the opposite on the idea that the Jew stands above you and holds a position in society that should have been yours, uh, owns the money that should have been yours, or has something that you deserved but didn't get 
because he somehow reserved you can say in English, usurped, I don't know, like he stole something that was supposed to be um, right. to be yours. So in a way, racism is like a complex of superiority, whereas sometimes anti-Semitism is like a, a jealousy, an envy, and sometimes even a complex of inferiority that um, uh, invites you to, I mean, allows you not to deal with your failure with the, you know, like kind, it's kind of a way to put aside your existential questioning and, and suppose that someone, someone else is responsible for your failure and for what you may be missing. Yeah, and, and I think um, indirectly, you're actually touching on something that um, is happening, uh, just beginning to happen in the, the protests here in the United States, which is anti-Semitic signs showing up uh, among the protesters. And I, I wonder if that's happening at all in France. So actually, there was a discussion in the past 48 hours in France. There was a big uh, um, Black Lives Matter um, demonstration in Paris two days ago. And in the protest, at a certain moment, the extreme right, uh, members of a group of extreme right uh, activists showed up and there was a uh, an attacked and provoked the activists, and there was a counter attack filled with anti-Semitism, which was an absolute, like the the sum of the nonsense. Like they were, you were, you had people from the extreme left screaming at extreme right anti-Semitic activists, uh, dirty Jews. So um, and and so there were a lot of, of of course it was very those were very isolated voice and they do not and it's important to say that uh, those voices minority voices in any way do not represent uh, uh, the movement and the, the core of these demonstrations against racism but I think it teaches us something very important that we need to be vigilant and to pay attention to it seems to me that. In the, and I remember it clearly, actually, in the years, uh, the 80s and the 90s, the fight against racism and anti-Semitism was a common fight. There was no right. way we were able to disconnect these fights. And something happened that actually I'm not able to point and to date precisely, but it seems today that many actors and activists in those fights seem uh, not to fight the same war today. You know, you suddenly find a lot of people who believe that the war against racism is their war, but not the war against anti-Semitism and vice versa. And I think it's a huge, huge mistake that we are going to pay very, um, a very heavy price for that, because I think there's no way we can disconnect these fights. We must be able to identify differences sometimes between racism and, and anti-Semitism, but I think there is no way we will be able to fight these terrible uh, disease of our society if we don't fight this war side by side. Yeah, in fact, it may even be worse than that because if the fight is uh, against racism is really the fight against uh, white supremacy and Jews are perceived as being part of that cadre of white supremacists, the fight against racism is also a fight against Jews. Yeah, because again, we go back to the idea that the Jews are supposedly owning something that they shouldn't own. And sometimes this idea of a privilege resonates with elements that unfortunately echo some anti-Semitic traditional um, uh, rhetorics. You know, these supposition that Jews are somehow um, yeah, holding um, a privilege that um, uh, that they that they stole from someone, you know. So we should really be careful with this uh, with this language. You know, it all goes back to to the question for me. It all goes back to the question of uh, of language. You know, it seems to me in recent years in France, I became just like many of my friends. I became very sensitive to um, what I would call anti-Semitic language. And sometimes this anti-Semitic language is not spoken by anti-Semites. And this is where we should be careful, you know. Um, sometimes people who really would not define themselves as anti-Semite, and I even think they've been struggling against it, against it for, for all their life. Sometimes the, the, the elements of anti-Semitic discourse, uh, you know, finding a scapegoat, 
and accusing someone else of having power or, or control over your life, um, suddenly it's as if, you know, the anti-Semitic language was a ghost that was somehow haunting the society we live in. Um, I don't know, I've, I'm in, in the past, uh, I'd say even yeah, weeks or, or months, months, I'm obsessed with this question of, uh, well, of ghosts. Well, when, when, you come, when you come back and visit, we'll explore that more. But I want to move on to just uh, one other issue because our time is sadly growing too short. Um, one of the things that you say uh, in the manuscript that I read is that the tropes, and you know, I'm paraphrasing, the tropes of anti-Israel harken mm -hmm. back to the themes of traditional anti-Semitism and that Israel is an obstacle to uh, historical wholeness. Can you uh, kind of create an equation between anti-Zionism or anti-Israel and anti-Semitism based yeah. on you know, your theories of research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very complex uh, question. It's here a very complex and touchy question, and I know it is also in the States. I've been asked so many times in recent years um, to comment the question, is anti-Semitism always is anti-Zionism always anti-Semitism? And I think it's it's much more complex than that. When people tell me today that they're anti-Zionist, and I do meet a lot of people who tell me they're anti-Zionist, I immediately stop the conversation and I ask them, what do you mean? And the my experience teach my experience teaches me that unfortunately, most of the time people are just totally unable to explain why what they mean by that. I mean, when you say you're an anti-Zionist, do you mean that Israel has no right to exist? Or do you mean that you, you are strongly and harshly criticizing today's policy in Israel? Um, most of the time, you know, anti-Zionism became a kind of gimmick uh, that prevents people from uh, you know, we were talking before about the need for complexity. So this is exactly at stake in this debate. Most of the time, um, you have no complexity in the ability to define what anti-Zionism is. I have no doubt that very often it serves as a way to, um, uh, to hide uh, an anti-Semitism that has stopped being kosher thanks God, you know, when you cannot say you're anti-Semite, for some people, anti-Zionism is like a, a, key, like a key word um, not to use um, an embarrassing, uh, you know, to avoid an embarrassing statement. But I think it, it could express something else. Just I simply don't understand why people need to invent uh, a term for that. If by if, if what if what you mean by anti-Zionism is the need to criticize Israel's policy, so then say it. But why would you need to invent a new term for that? You know, if I want to criticize Trump's policy today or another leader's policy in the world, would I need to invent a term for that? I'm not sure. So I think again it goes back to a question of language how do we manipulate language and what kind of ghosts and spirits are present in the words we're using sometimes mm -hmm. as we are aware of that and sometimes not being aware of that yeah you know it used to be that there was a sharp division between the policies of the government of israel and the people of israel and there was a sharp division between the israel and jews worldwide those those boundaries those borders have been obliterated so in fact what happens is the policies of Israel equates with Jews worldwide, uh, which is in certain ways why we're put on the spot and trying to explain things that with which we don't agree. But I wanna move on to a, a question that's come from um, from our, our listeners or our viewers. Uh, and one is that, you know, you have really made an argument through uh, that anti-Semitism uh, can be seen through the roots of our tradition. And the question is, uh, is there a prescription offered in these traditional sources and how would we apply today to, to combat that or to rid the world of that? Mm. Well, um, I think what the rabbis mainly teach us uh, is not a recipe against anti 
anti-Semitism. I'm sorry about that. I would have loved to tell you on page this or that of the Talmud, we have the final recipe against uh, hate of the Jews. It's not there. But what the rabbis teach us is that um, we should be able to identify a specific context in history that will promote anti-Semitism. As I said, the rabbis are really aware that this obsession around um, authenticity, purity, identity and closed identity are the perfect um, medium uh, to enable uh, the hate of the Jews. So they, they enable us to identify those moments. And I think also what they give us, and it's very pressure, precious, I'm, I'm, I think, and I experience it on a daily basis, is that Jewish tradition gives us keys of resilience. Like it teaches us um, that even though anti-Semitism will probably not disappear, that we are still around. And there is a possibility for Jews to, to stand out of the tragedy and never to let their history be told as a tragedy. You know, mm -hmm. the capacity of staying true actors and not victims of what happens to you. You know, this ability to tell your own story, even sometimes through Jewish humor, the ability to laugh at ourselves, like self-derision and self-criticism, you know, is a very, very powerful key to remain, um, you know, in charge of your own life, uh, to, to feel that you're still an actor uh, and in responsibility for what might be. And I think it's a powerful tool for us Jews, obviously, as a key of resilience, but I think it's also a very powerful tool for the world today. And maybe we need to say a word about that. I think we live in a time uh, of competition, of uh, victimhood. Very often people, uh, today we feel that a lot of people love to tell their own story through the lens of the pain that happened to them or their ancestors. And it's okay to, you know, to, to be aware and to share and to speak about your pain and the pain of your history. But you should always make sure that this tragedy doesn't define you. And it's not the core of who you are. It happened to you, but it doesn't say who you are because you can always be beyond what happened to you. And I think it's a very powerful teaching that Jews can teach the world, actually. And I think we desperately all need today um, uh, to hear narratives of resilience wherever they come from. You know, and, and, and in that regard, a uh, question's been asked and, um, as, you know, pointing out that many Jews have left par uh, France for Israel. Uh, and the question is, when does, when do things get bad enough, right? That uh, they, the Jews will know that they have to leave. Do you think it will happen? Uh, and I, I would frame it uh, in a positive way, you know, frame the question in a positive way. Um, what can we learn from France in terms of the ability to address these issues, you know, their grants has had great thinkers and writers and you know, tremendous mm -hmm. culture. Are there messages that can come from from French culture and, and literature and philosophy that will help us rid the world or rid at least France of this? And how will Jews know if it is necessary to leave? Many Germans miss that mark. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question uh, has been asked many times in recent years. Um, uh, many people asked us, especially Jewish leaders in France, are you going to stay? Are you going to leave? And I often felt that this question was more than problematic because what I wanted to hear from people, especially from my fellow citizens here in France, was not when are you going to leave? What's the brand of your suitcase? But more what are we gonna to do together to make sure that our children are protected, all our children? So to answer your question, I think that France is a good example of uh, what, um, you know, what complex relationships Jews can have to the country they inhabit. You know, French Jewish history is made of the brightest light and the darkest, um, uh, how do you say, uh, like the, 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 the deepest darkness that you can imagine. France is the country that emancipated the Jews, you know, uh, the first country that emancipated the Jews. And France is the country of the Dreyfus Affair. France is the country of Vichy, the Vichy government. 
Um, but France is also the first country that had Léon Blum, a Jewish uh, leader at the head of the state. So you can actually give arguments in both directions that France uh, and F French Jews have a history of uh, confidence and defiance of believing and despair and hope intertwined with, with each other. And actually, I can testify of this because I come from a family, a very long family of French Jews um, that has been um, in love with the French Republic for centuries and deeply attached to this country, but at the same time, very aware of its dark sides and the dark moments of its history. And I think it, it, if it's true in France, it, it's true all over the world. I think Jews are really aware even when they feel very comfortable where they are, uh, I think there is always a feeling um, that something could change. And actually, um, there could always, could always pop up in society someone who tells you that even though you think you belong, maybe you don't, you don't belong. Even though you think you're an insider, something could make out of you a kind of outsider or an unwanted presence. And I think most of the Jews in the world are aware of this complexity. So to answer your question, when do Jews need to know that it's time to leave? I think there's something very important to know about French Jews today. And it's actually, those were the words of the French ambassador we heard before. It seems to me that today, the government and the French Republic and the public power is fighting this war. It doesn't mean that it's always a fight made of success, you know, uh, but um, I think it's very, very critical for the Jews, and it has always been, to feel somehow that the, the power in charge, the public power, um, is, uh, is fighting on, on their side. And that's the main difference between what we experience now and what German Jews experienced in the 30s. I mean, the moment the leaders, uh, politicians, governments are not on your side, so then it might be hopeless. But as long as we can fight this war side by side, as long as we don't feel that we are alone in this war, there is still hope because as was said, as was said uh, before, actually, we all know that um, anti-Semitism in a society always tells you um, uh, always tells you something about the health of this society or the lack of health um, of this uh, society. Jews are always struck first and then generally the violence will touch everyone. So a uh, question has been asked and, and I'm going to apologize to those who have asked questions. We may not get to all of them uh, today, which kind of gives us a door into doing this again. But um, what do you think about Macron's decision to legislate uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Is that helpful or not? I think it, it was not exactly um, formulated in this way. Um, uh, I think what Macron said, he accepted this definition that, uh, and I think it's a good thing that actually sometimes anti-Zionism -Sem, anti serves as a, a way to hide anti-Semitism. But I don't think he, precisely equated the two, the two terms. And I don't think it's useful to equate precisely the two terms as if they meant exactly the same thing. I think for some people, they don't mean the same thing, but I do think we immediately have to stop the conversation with someone who tells you he's anti-Zionist and to ask him to clarify precisely what he means because it's totally legitimate to criticize Israel. I deeply believe it's legitimate to criticize Israel, but I don't think it is to question its right of existence. Yeah, but by the way, many oftentimes when I hear somebody say they're anti-Zionist, the next sentence is, but some of my best friends are Jewish, right? Yeah. And in other words, to, to prove I'm, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just an anti-Israel because you, you Jews don't have a right to that land. Yeah. Um, also, so another, I, another interesting thing is that you have today in the world some people who um, who tell you they're not anti-Semite because they love specific types of Jews. You know, some people tell you, uh, yeah, I, I love Jews when they are nationalist or Zionist, or I love Jews 
when they are from the left. Or I love, you know, and loving a certain type of Jews uh, is always suspicious, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm going to, and we went, uh, we started a little late, so we're going to go a little over uh, the announced time of the ending. Besides, I'm having too much fun. Um, so, uh, you know, in a certain way, when you were talking about Jewish identity, you you gave um, you gave us a positive spin for what I would call what some of us call Jewish neurosis. In other words, complexity. Um, you know, in which we are, have the absolute ability to have conversations with ourselves. And it's not ourselves as other Jews, ourselves as individuals. We can have, you know, sometimes the most interesting conversations with ourselves. Um, but uh, you say that, uh, and this is a, a really, I think it, it's towards the end of the manuscript, so it, I'm giving a hint for everybody to buy the book when it comes out. Um, you say there's only one way to get rid of Jews. All you have to do is to convince Jews they know exactly what Jewishness is. And by the time you've done that, there won't be any left. You can <laughs> extrapolate, tell us what, uh, send us off, you yeah. know, not that we're finished, but send us off with an understanding of that. Yeah, because I know, as I said, I think uh, a lot of people are obsessed with their identity, where it comes from, uh, what's the core of their identity. And I think the, what enabled Judaism to stay alive is the fact that along history, Jews were never, never able to define what's the core of their Jewishness. Of, you know, as you know, as in, and it, it, we obviously we, have, we can talk about it in a rabbinic conversation. If you ask uh, rabbis what makes you a Jew, uh, some Orthodox rabbi will tell you if you have a Jewish mother or if you convert to Judaism, you're a Jew. But as you know, and as we all know, there are other definitions. Some people will tell you I'm Jewish because uh, um, because I love to tell jokes, because I have a special relationship to Israel, because I speak Hebrew, because my time is Jewish, because I practice, because I believe it. We can go, I mean, we would never end this conversation, what it means to be a to, to, to be a Jew and what's the core of this definition. But this inability to, uh, to give a definition of Jewishness actually prevented Judaism to give a definition of what it is. You know, if you lack a definition, so then you can infinitely transform uh, who you are. And actually Jews have a very sp special talent for experiencing the unending identity. You know, you can, I mean, basically the next Jew will tell you and will tell me, will tell us what it means to be a Jew. And as long as the last Jew doesn't appear, we will, we will not know what it means finally to be Jewish. And this possibility of unending definition and interpretation actually uh, is what allowed Judaism to remain alive. And today I'm very suspicious, uh, in, even in the Jewish community, when people are so convinced that they know um, what's, you know, the, what's the end or the goal of, of, of pure or authentic Judaism. I would even say, and it would be a criticism against certain types of Zionists now, sometimes people tell you that, uh, uh, their Zionism is, is the end of their Judaism, in a way. And I think it's a mistake. I think Judaism was never able to define um, precisely and finally what it is and what it will be for the next ones. And I think um, we are somehow saved by that. It's something that bothers dearly the anti-Semites, you know, they can't stand the fact that Jews can never define on what relies their identity. But I think it's a very treasured um, element of who we are. We are always on a journey, uh, just like Abraham. Um, 18 years ago, maybe that would be a nice conclusion, 18 years ago when I was at the 92nd Street Y, I was listening to Rabbi Norman Cohen teaching that day, it was in November 2002. He was teaching about Abram's Lech Lecha. And I was standing in the room there at the 92nd Street Y. And on that day, I felt that my Lech Lecha was taking me to rabbinical school. And actually, I feel that in my rabbinet, I just keep teaching about this moment. You know, uh, I keep giving maybe the same sermon, you know, teaching that actually we have never said 
our last word. And we're always in this journey, making sure that the promised land is ahead of us. And, and you know, you know what, I, I really feel that anti-Semitism is a refusal of this, you know, infinite possibility of being that Jews represent. Well, of all the good things that Norman Cohn does, I'm going to explain to him that you're among the, the very top of the list. But I, I, I know you wanted to think of that as the end, but I have one last question, which I think will help kind of pull it together. Your, your, your child comes to you and ready to become bar bar mitzvah and says, mommy, why, why be Jewish? What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, it somehow happened to me myself. <laughs> I became a bar mitzvah last year, and uh, and it was a tough journey. Like he, just like maybe many children of rabbis, he, he didn't understand exactly. All what, children of rabbis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and actually, I think the, the answer is that. Um, Judaism um, desperately needs his way of saying what it means to be a Jew. That actually Judaism cherishes incredibly what we've been receiving, but more than what we've been receiving, we cherish the way the new generation will reinterpret this for us. You know, it's the amazing equilibrium between transmission from above and the capacity to learn from uh, know what we give who we give birth to um, I often tell my children that um, you know the moment they were born we gave them a, a name and giving a name in Judaism naming a baby is saying for example if it's a boy you say this is my son is Samuel so is Samuel Ben Pnina, Delphine, Pnina is my Hebrew word. But when you say that my son is Samuel Ben Pnina, in Hebrew you actually said uh, something very interesting. Ben in Hebrew means son of, but it also means builder of. Boné means to build in Hebrew. So actually you say that your children, Samuel, is a builder of his mother. And, um, and I think it's a very powerful statement. You give an identity to someone, but at the minute you name that new person in the world, you tell him, you know what? You're going to build the world that gave birth to you. You're going to be the builder. And I think Judaism um, is, is, is a lesson we give to our children constantly. We tell them that actually um, this tradition means something if they make something out of what we author them. So uh, Delphine, uh, you are a gift uh, to the Jews of France um, because you're helping them build their community. You're, I think, a gift to the entire nation of France and you're certainly a gift to the Jews worldwide. And for all those reasons, uh, not only did I love uh, being with you today, but I have a open invitation for you to come to the 92nd Street Y when you're ever in the United States. Um, on behalf of all of us, we wish you a great deal of mazal, look forward to reading your book, and thank you on behalf of World Jewish Congress, the government of France, um, and the 92nd Street Y. Let's all go thank on you. together. Thank you so much for your invitation. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Great. for Bye-bye.